All right, today we're going to build a voting app, the same voting app that I built for EU versus virus for the hackathon. Well, not quite the same. It's going to be a bit simpler so that we're faster in this tutorial. But you're going to see all the elements that I used so that you can also make your own app and even more. So let's check it out and see how it works first. And then we start to build it. First of all, we need to create an account here and sign up. All right, signing up with the Mailinator email address, which is a disposable email client and I can just access this email over the browser without password or anything. It makes it easier for the tutorial. So I'm signing up. The app understands immediately that I'm logged in. It shows me a different button. I click it and now it says, hey, you know what? You need to confirm your email. Now, why did I build this? Well, because people could sign up with any email address, even if it's not real. So they could create multiple users and vote multiple times, which would be really bad for voting applications. So let's check it out. We have an email on the user four. Yeah, actually two even. Clicking on the link would confirm the email. Perfect. Now my email is confirmed. I can start voting and the app chooses the first project to vote on and redirects me directly there with this ID. And I can start reading the text and start putting my vote. I submit my vote, which will redirect me to the next project I should vote for. Great, once there is no other project available to vote for, let's say I voted for all of them already, or I reached some kind of limit that is set in the app, then the app will show me a thank you message and will tell me to go to Giphy to have some fun. Whoa, that was disturbing. Anyhow, let's jump to the editor and let's build this app together. Let's do this, guys. All right, so you saw what we want to build. So let's get started by creating an app on Bubble. But first, energy time. Okay, create an app. Give it a name. Finally, Bubble created an app. And the first thing you see is that there is an assistant trying to help you out. But today, I'm your assistant, so let's close it. Okay, so the first thing you see is that Bubble created some pages for you. You're on the index page, which is the start page of the whole app. Then there is a password reset page for that feature. Then a 404 page for everything where the user types in a URL that doesn't really exist, then this page will be shown. And yeah, and there is also content on the page. And what we want to do now is get rid of all this content so we can create our own. What I do want to keep on this page is this element here because it gives us the width of the content of the page. And that's important because it has nicely 40 pixels to each side and we can use that for the whole app that we're building. Later on, it will be very helpful when creating responsive designs so that they always have the nice space on the sides. So I will move those two elements to the top so that we don't have so much space from the top to the bottom of the page. Okay, and I will also take the bottom of that page and just drag it up so that it closes with the footer. All right. By the way, if you extend the content of the page, the page will grow with it. But if you make it smaller, it will not. So let's take this element here and align it to the center. So the first things we want to create on this page is a headline and two buttons. One of them will say, hey, sign up or log in so that you can vote at all. And the other button will say, click to start voting. Of course, the click to start voting button will only be useful if you already have a profile. A useful component in Bubble is a group, so this is already one of them. And the reason why it's such a useful component is because, let me show you, if you put buttons in here, you can of course move the group around and it will move everything what it's inside, which is great. By the way, let's undo this so that our spacing is still good. But you can also put a data source here into the group and that will contain 
type of data that will then be inherited by all of the objects inside of that group. And this is a very, very powerful concept in Bubble and it uses it basically everywhere. So keep this in mind. I will now go ahead and create the headline. Okay, so the headline is nice, but it's not really centered. So what I will do here is remove the style and just put it to the center. Okay, it's much better. Then we have this group here, but actually what we need are two groups. We would need one of them to contain one button and the other one to contain the other button. So let's delete this one because we can then just duplicate the group and such, in such way have two of them. Okay, so we still have 40 pixels from left and right. That's super cool. We just vertically and horizontally align this one. We give it a content here. We say uh, sign up, okay, or login to vote. Let's change this one here. Okay, this doesn't look super cool, so let's make it bigger. And also, all these buttons on this template have a 60 pixel, oops, <laughs> a 60 pixel height. So I will give it 60 pixel height. And okay, I have to align it again horizontally and vertically, just to be sure it's correct. Huh? Okay, great. So of course, this group should only be visible when I'm not already logged in. So let's do this now. Conditional, actually conditional works on a lot of elements, so this will be valuable knowledge. Okay, so if the current user isn't logged in, then this element is visible. Yeah, that's it. Simple stuff. By the way, I need something to drink. Okay, don't forget to hydrate, okay? All right, next thing is to create the second button. So for that, I just copy this group, duplicate it, put it nicely on, on the bottom of the other one, change some logic and text. So let's do it. Control C, Control V, snap it here. That's actually important so that Bubble later on can align your content properly. And by the way, I forgot one small thing. A group also has this feature of being able to collapse whenever it's not shown. So what means that all these pixels that it consumes now, they will be set to zero, so other content can be visible and, uh, and, and not consume the space if it's not visible at all. So you have to click, collapse, yeah, collapses element, hide when hidden. So yeah, click this one and here as well. Okay, so now the second button, let's make it more useful. So here it says, start voting. And, okay voting of course and this group should be visible when the user is logged in right and now there is one more concept that makes this a bit tiny bit better and more elegant so imagine now those elements will be shown on the page from the beginning and then one of them will be hidden so you will have this flickering effect where they are here, but then they are not here, right? In order to avoid that, it's actually a good idea to say that this element is visible on the page, no, and here also no, because we already told it when it should be visible. It should be visible when the user is logged in in that case, and when the user is not logged in in that other case. So now what happens is the page loads, and then only the elements that should be visible appear. So it's much more elegant. So now it's time to preview our page for the first time. For that, we click this button, wait for it to load, of course, drink some coffee in the meantime. Because why not? Great, so we see that only one button appears, which is the one asking us to sign up or log in to start voting, because we are actually really not logged in at all. So that's nice and all, but when I click this button, nothing happens. So let's add this logic. For that, we click on this button and we find in this dialog, in the settings of this button, we find start or edit the workflow. What is a workflow? Well, a workflow in Bubble is where you define the logic of your application. 
this is what also makes Bubble really powerful. You can be very, very creative on the logic. So we click this button and what happens is that Bubble creates for this button, you see it displays it here, a workflow possibility where we can add actions. And the action that we want to happen here is that we want to show an element, show an element, and that element will be the sign up and login pop-up. And let's preview it quickly. Ta-da! Okay, but how does this work? How does this thing know to show this dialog and where is this dialog from and everything? It's a bit of magic. Let me show you. So in the element tree of this page, you will see that there are some elements that we are familiar with because we created them ourselves. So the headline, the buttons, and so on, the footer is still there. But we also have this thing, which is hidden because it shouldn't be shown before no action happened. So what we just did is basically, we just told it, hey, show up, right? You're already there, so just show up. But you will also see that this same dialog pop-up is a reusable element. So this comes out of the box, right? So Bubble creates an app for you where you can log in users, sign up users, send them email confirmations, change their passwords and so on, reset the passwords as you can see here, without you having to implement this stuff. And this is really cool because this is very basic stuff. You will need this in many, many apps. So it comes out of the box and you can just make use of it. It might feel like a bit of magic at the beginning, because it's already there, but actually you can click on these things and you can inspect them and see what they're doing. So I'm now in the sign up and login pop-up, like I was in the index page, same, and if I click on the workflow, I see what this pop-up is now up to. So for example, if I click on the login button, then this logic will happen. Log the user in, right? It will take the email address from the field and so on. So this has been taken care of. You can check this out yourself. And we will adapt a little bit of actions here, not many, but you can see that this element is not magic. It's there, but you can inspect it, you can change it, you can go ahead and change the text here and whatever you like to make it look like you want to. Okay, next thing we want to do is we want to go back to the index page and we really want to change this logo here. So for that, you need to understand reusable components. So those are components that are to be found here, right? You have footer, which is this thing. You have a header, which is this thing. And, and the pop-up that we were just discussing before. So the cool thing about them is they are standalone elements. They have their own logic and everything, and you can drag them in and they will always look the same. So that's great if you have a header or a menu, which should be always the same on every page. So then you don't need to take care of it on each single page because that would be awful. So in order to edit this, we double click it and, well, no, that's not what I really wanted, but we double click it here and we just click on edit element. So now we're inside of this header and to be honest, I want to delete part of it here. Yeah, we don't need that. And also I want to change the logo. So let's do that now. We double click this logo here and we clear the existing image. Then we just browse our computer for a new image. So here, and we choose our logo. This is, well, this logo here. Okay, great. Open. Okay, dokie. And now what we want to do is we want to drag it and to make sure that it snaps to the edges of this existing um, element here. So for that, to make it a bit easier, I will zoom in here, 200 pixels. And we just we just drag it here, right? And you see that actually, if I don't click any other button, I would destroy the aspect ratio. So let's undo this. So I'm holding shift while I'm dragging this along, right? So then what happens is, okay, it snaps, perfect. Done. <laughs> let's zoom out again here, 100. Bubble, you could make this easier to zoom in and out, by the way. Okay, so we go back to the index page. And you see it's it's changed and it's great. So let's look at the preview. Okay, cool. So now it looks more like it. And if I click this button, I arrive on the sign up. So let's sign up with the user and then see in the database what actually happened. So I use Mailinator because it's a pretty easy mailbox that I can use 
for reading emails without logging in at all. So basically it's this one here. I can just type in I can just type in here the user one, which is like a public email uh, uh, inbox, right? So and my emails will arrive here. So it's just a trick. So I'm signing up. All right, great, thank you. But now the button change, which is actually perfect. This is our conditional that we said before. So now it says start voting. Of course, nothing happens here, but it will soon. And I will show you how. First, a drink, and then let's check what's in the database. So we go into the database and we see there is already a table called user. Well, that's because Bubble offers you all of this user management out of the box. So of course, there is already a data table for that. But if you go to app data, we can actually look inside and see what's, what's containing in there. So we see our user, we see create a date. Yeah, but that's it. We didn't ask the user for its name or anything. But for us, that's good enough. And for this example as well. So if I go back here and I log out, I can now log in as well. By the way, I can also click on this button. They do exactly the same. I have to then go to login, put my username, my password, and I'm almost logged in. There you go. Pretty easy stuff. So we created logic that shows up depending on the logged in state. And we also managed to get the user into the database, log him in and everything, pretty easy stuff. So in the next section, we will look at the database a bit more and we will create more tables to have projects and votes so that people can vote. See you there. Okay, let's continue. After a short break and a lot of coffee, we are ready to move on with the database of this voting application. But before we do that, smash the like button, hit the subscribe button. You know how long it takes to make such tutorials? <laughs> okay, let's hop right in. So first of all, we want to create two new tables, one for projects and one for votes. For that, we go into the data types tab here and we see we already have user, but we just create new one, right? Projects. Projects and votes. Okay, cool. Back to the projects. In the projects, we want to add some new fields so that we can describe what project that is. So we will create the title of the project, a uh, field that stores information about the team that is part of that project, the business model, and also the uniqueness of that project. So imagine those are startups and they are pitching for getting to the next stage. So let's do it now. We choose text for the title. Business model is also a text. Uniqueness is also a text. We create only text today. Okay, great. So that's it for now for the project. And we will create some test entries in a short while. Now in the votes table, we also have those three fields, team, business model, and uniqueness. But this time there are number fields. And the reason for that is that the judge can drag a slider from one to 10 to give his vote. So let's do it. Team vote will be a number, then business model will be a number, and uniqueness will also be a number. The reason for choosing a number is that Bubble then understands what you can do with that number. You can do smaller than, bigger than, plus minus operations. Otherwise, it wouldn't give you that option. Okay, that's nice. But now comes the interesting part. So you can give the numbers, but it doesn't say for what you voted and doesn't say who voted. So let's create two new fields. One of them would be the user who voted and the other one would be the project. And both of them would be links to the other tables. So there are relationships basically. So the user that voted, picking user, which is referring to this table here, and 
only one user can vote at a time, so that's cool. And then here project, and here picking project, which is from this table. What that means, I will show you now. Okay, but before I can show you the magic, I have to put in some projects, some dummy data, so that we can have something to play with. I click on new entry, and I will now go ahead and add three projects with some dummy data for us. So when we go to the app data and we create a new vote entry, which of course later on it will be created by the user interface, not by us here. But let's say I voted 10 out of 10 here. And now it's about the project, right? So see that Bubble knows that there is a project called Mega something, right? Or something with Uber, right? So it knows to make the relation to the project that already exists and to the user, which is this one, right? So when I create this, it will have created the relations between them. So later on, this is super important because Bubble understands this relation, of course, and in the user interface, you can then um, display the project and then you can say, save all this project with these votes in that table and you will know exactly what to do. And this is very important concept in general to link things together. And in normal databases, you can do even more than that. But Bubble has some limitations. So for example, and I forgot to do that, in the projects, we also need to link the project to a bunch of users that voted for that project. And let me do it now. And the reason for that, so I call it users, or we can call it users that voted, right, for this project, and we relate it to user. And this time, this will be a field with multiple entries. So you will find in one field, in one cell, multiple entries of users. And why we need that is because of a limitation of, of bubble, where we cannot write any query we want, um, where we would basically look into this table and, uh, and see did this user already vote for exactly this project? You cannot do that. So instead what we're doing is we are putting all of the users that voted for that project into the same into the project. And whenever we filter for those projects, we just say that one user shouldn't be part of this. Then what happens is that we can filter out that project so you cannot vote twice for the same project. So that would look something like this. You add a user here, it's only one now. Add a user, right? And later on when we do the, the business logic, we just say, give me a project where my current logged in user name is not part of this list. Okay, so we manage that. We have the database, we have the start page, we have the login logic. Now let's go to the most important one, which is the voting itself. All right, going to the design tab reveals the existing page that we already have, the index page. And by the way, because I didn't mention it before, it is really a good idea to give your elements good names. So here we have group. So the box itself is a group. Sign up to vote, right? It's the group for that. Then the button is a button with a proper title. So it makes life much easier later on when you go to the workflows and you have to then select from a drop-down where you don't see those elements um, to quickly find the one you need. Okay, so we will first create a new page which will be called vote and we will, we will clone the existing index page for that because it's a bit easier, it copies all of these things, also the header and the footer so we don't have to take care of that. And then we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and implement the voting logic to show a project and to vote for it with the sliders. Let's do it. Okay, for that, we create a new page. We call it vote and we clone the index page and we wait. Okay, that didn't take too long. So first of all, we will create a group like this one. Actually, we can take this one, rename it and stuff. And we like the group, right? Because it can contain data, which it will. And all the elements inside of that group will then relate to that data, which is the project itself, to display the dynamic content. So let's do it now. So I will just make this group 
higher and I will make sure to move this title within that group. You see when it's red it means it will fall inside of the group. You can see that also here when you open the group here you will see what's inside of it, what is considered inside of it and this is important because all of these elements will then relate to the, this group's settings and conditionals and stuff. By the way this conditional is not needed so we can remove it. Okay, so within that group we will create the design that we saw in the introduction of the video where we have a title of the question to be asked, then we have the slider to slide around, the number next to the slider showing the value where it currently is, and on the bottom we have a button to submit and save the vote. So as you can imagine we will take this button and repurpose it for that save my vote logic. So save my vote, something like that. We make the group a bit longer here and we move the, the footer down to make a bit more space and the button will be definitely on the bottom of this and the title it will be dynamic. We will see very soon how that will look like. So first of all I will create those three boxes that I need for displaying the content for each project and each project has, let's check it out again, a title but definitely a business model, a team description and a uniqueness description. So that is what I want to create now. So for that I will basically, I will create a group and I will make it, so yeah, as long as the whole content is here within that other group and I will add inside, without any design, I will add inside um, a text for the title of what we're talking about here. So that will be for example team and then another text for the actual description of the team and then with more space I will add a slider and because I don't know where it is I will just search for it. All right. I will now go ahead and make sure those things are aligned and okay one more text is missing which is the current value of the sliders position and I will now go ahead in a bit more rapid fashion and make these things aligned and make them look good so mostly I will click on specific um, headline uh, styles and I will make sure to snap them nicely together but yeah, you can get creative here, right, on how this looks like. So let me go through this quickly and see you on the other side. Okay, I think it's cool um, for now and I give it a good name like we're used to now. So it's group team. Okay, cool. So I think it's, it's okay for now. Um, actually, maybe I should... Make sure that the, the margins are okay and I will do that now. Oh, okay, so most of the time I spent with making sure that the margins are the same on all the sides, 20 pixels all over the place, on the bottom, left and right. I mean, this is this is really helpful later on when you when you do responsive design editing, and yeah, you will see in a few minutes. So now comes the interesting part, which is why we also used the groups. So this group outside will host all of these fields, right? So we will say that it will host project data because what we will look on here is a project, right? And then we can make changes to that. So every group now needs to inherit that data. So the next group is this one and here we also need to select projects. But if we don't do this then Bubble will help us actually. So check this out. If I want to say that I care about I care about uh, project here then it says yeah but you need to change the parent thing which is the the next group here to be a project. So I'm like yeah okay sure. And that's it right? You You told the group that you will show a project. You told that group that it's also a project and then here Bubble complains because we didn't say what from that project we want to show. Of course we want to show 
uh, well, actually, not in this one. <laughs> okay, so that was kind of a small mistake, but no problem. Because that's the title, it's always the same. But here we want to show the, the team description. Right? And here we want to show the parents project's title. So now this thing became dynamic. So now it gets really interesting. So what I will do now is I will copy this group, right, this one, and I will control C, control V it, and put it just below. Make sure it's within this group here, right? And it is, you can see here. And just change the names and, and fill it in for the next category, which is business model, let's say. Okay, business model, right? So here I will say business model, <laughs> and here we will say that we want to show the business model information. Okay, that's cool. Oh, by the way, I think I forgot to give this a good name. So slider team. Then slider business model. And slider value team. Yeah, good names are, are really hard to find, okay? So it's really important to do this stuff. Um, slider value business model, okay. And I need to create some more space here. So let's move this even further down. This as well, this as well. Always make sure it's aligned in the center. Okay, so copy this one, put it here make another one not a big deal so this one would be the uniqueness so imagine the startup explained why they're they're so cool right and why they are special so uniqueness coming from the database is here right and this one as well and this one as well and did i yes i did okay so it looks pretty good i will put the button somewhere here of course um yeah the space here should be the same and this can be done no that was the wrong thing to do i will just align it horizontally and have 60 and here we have 71 okay fine i don't want to waste your time too much but make sure those margins are always the same at least the ones that you expect to have okay plus one that's easy to do and that's also 60 Ooh, i'm happy now okay so that's nice but now when we preview the page you will see that we don't really see anything it's because yeah it's because the group doesn't have any information about which project to show at all and also we clicked on collapse this element if when it's hidden right and it is hidden uh, actually this one yeah because it doesn't have any data so let's give him some data so the way this will work is that we go to the vote page and we will put a new parameter here to the URL. It's called the URL parameter. And we call it project ID. And the project ID will be a number, the unique ID of that project that Bubble gave it. So for example, we go to the data and we see that we, we have projects, but Bubble doesn't show the unique ID from the beginning. So we can click on this one and just add it to the view. And then we get the, an ID. So let's copy this one, or actually that one. I didn't vote for it yet. And just put it here and load the page. Okay, nothing happens because we didn't tell Bubble to search the database for this ID and then give that information to the group, which will then lead to seeing all the data. Okay, so let's do it now. So again, we need to go to the workflows and tell Bubble what to do. So we are on the vote page, we click on workflow. 
we make sure by the way this was this has been copied from when I duplicated the page we don't need this one we will say the following when the page is loaded then please go to the database and fetch that data and give it to the group so the group can render the rest of the page so page is loaded then we say element oops, element display data and that's for groups you see so this is exactly what we have so we're saying you know what I want my group vote it's no it's not called vote let me see how it's called actually now that's the wrong name right uh, let's call it group vote you see names are very important so okay so group vote to display specific data and what kind of data should it now display well it has to do a search for that ID that we have in the URL so it will do that it will search for a project and it will search for the project's unique ID to be and now it's interesting get data from page URL to be project ID copying this one put it here right so that's it right it will just search exactly for that it's still complaining because we still have to say yeah but what if I find multiple the bubble bubble does not know that we will find only one yes so we will have to say I don't know um, first item for example right it doesn't matter there's only one result because an ID is unique so what happens now is that on page load bubble will search for that project and add it to the group vote add it here to the data source it's empty now because we can also I mean bubble gives you the option to put something fixed right but we want to to set it dynamically and because it's here it will be used in the whole rest of the of the groups children so let's try this out oops I forgot one tiny important thing so this group has the data that's cool but these groups here they don't know that they relate to this other one so I have to say parent groups projects right so we will go one more up to get the data from there so I do this on all of them one more thing is because I duplicated the index page I have to of course say please make this visible otherwise um, this is pretty bad so yeah all those groups are visible okay but now it should work rock and roll okay so we see the name of the project we see the text of the project from the database and we see this ugly looking sliders um, okay but that's cool already we are one step further now next step is to make sure that this doesn't look as ugly and to also make sure that this text here actually shows the value of the slider right because it can go from 0 1 2 3 4 5 to 10 so let's do it first the logic so here we want to really show the current value of the slider and the slider is the team slider right it's the slider team and it has a value and that's it basically now it should work already let's check it out yeah perfect we do the same thing for the rest of them okay and now let's take care of the arrangement of uh, of the elements here so the reason why this is happening is because the responsiveness is set differently for those elements so if you make this bigger here you see that the slider goes to the right while the text somehow remains to the left so the reason for that is that the slider has a fixed width and it doesn't grow but just let it grow so here we just let it grow as much as needed okay that's cool and then we still have an issue I think is because on a big screen this will be this will be pretty ugly so I would like to make sure that these actually the whole group why not uh, doesn't grow more than its actual 
this it's actual hundred percent set setting that I that we have in our bubble um, setup, which means which means that it will not grow more than than these pixels here thousand. So let's check it out. Yeah, it looks much better, I would say. So cool. Let's check it out. Yeah, nice. Okay, cool. And what if we want to show a different project? Well, in that case, we just need to show a different ID here to use one. Copy paste it and put a different ID and just load it. And we have a different project. So most of the logic is already there. And now we just need to make sure to pick the right project whenever a user clicks on, I want to vote now. So I'm talking about this button here when you're logged in. Okay, let me log in. So, thank you. When, when a user clicks on start voting, we need to search a database for the next project that the user should vote for. Then just redirect the user to that URL with the parameter and we're cool, right? So let's do that now. Oh my god, but first... And also, I mean, I do have a fortune cookie lying around for a while, so let's see what's inside and if it's a good fortune for this application. Okay, uh, it says... You will find much happiness in your daily activities. Not bad. What is my daily activity? Recording YouTube videos? Never know. Alright, we have everything ready that we need to build the next thing. The next thing is to think about how to send the user to the right project to vote for. And for that, I want to show you a massive trick that can help you with many apps. So think about it. When we click this button here, we want to send him to the next voting project. But also, when we are on the vote and the user clicks on, yeah, okay, uh, in a much better text here, clicks on save my vote, then we need to save the vote, but we then also need to redirect to the next project. So again, we need the logic already twice. And trust me, we need it actually three times, and you will see later on why. So it doesn't really make sense to create that logic three times, okay? It's just not a good idea to replicate code uh, and logic. It's better to have it in one place and reuse it. And how can we make that happen in Bubble? Well, there is a way to trigger a custom event from a reusable element, and it is here. And what is a reusable element? Well, it is one of well, one of those items here, right? Reusable elements, it says here. And the question is, do we have one of them here on the page? Yes, we have this one. Okay, we're not gonna change this one to host our voting logic, but what we will do is we'll, we will create a new such reusable element and put our logic in there and then use that element in all of the pages where we need that logic. So let's go and do that. So the element is called shared actions. Okay, it doesn't allow me to write uh, anything capital. And I don't clone anything. Oops. Don't click outside of that box. Shared actions, okay. And it will be a box. We don't care too much about the design because we only need the logic. So we go to the workflow while we have it selected and we create a custom event. And we give that custom event a name and we call it uh, go to next project. And we just call it like that and that's it. And let's go back, let's say to the index page to to see that we actually can, okay, first of all, we need to add that to the page, okay? So I add this to the page and I make sure to make it invisible, right? So it does not load when the page is loading. And you can put it anywhere, it doesn't really matter. 
because the user will never see that. So now in the workflow, we can trigger a custom event from a reusable element and we can trigger from the shared actions, we can trigger go to next project. Really nice. Now what we need to do is simply put the logic into that reusable element and always when we need it, trigger it from there. And you will see we will need it a lot. Okay, but uh, let's delete this one because that was just a demonstration. Okay, now let's put this logic onto this button. So when the user clicks on start voting, we trigger a workflow and we trigger this specific action that we selected before. Okay, so that's it, right? The button still doesn't do anything because this, this uh, shared element doesn't yet have logic, but let's go and put the logic there. All right, so how would that logic work? The logic should be like this. The current logged in user shouldn't be part of the project that we want to show to that user, which means basically the user didn't yet vote for it. So we expect this line to not appear. We expect any of the two other projects, so the Uber project or the Amazon killer business project to appear and the happiness brain implant should not appear because I already voted for it. Okay, so let's build that logic. We want to send the user to a new page which is the vote page. Remember the one with the project ID in the URL. And we want to send more parameters to that page, which is of course the project ID. Okay, but which project ID? Well, we want to do a search for a project where the users, where is that thing? Users that voted does not contain the current user. Okay, almost done. <laughs> of course, we need to take, and here I recommend taking random item. It's because you will find, wait, random items, unique ID, of course, because you will find the list of projects, right? And you don't need to show them top down. You can just randomize them to make it a bit more interesting. And actually, for voting, that's good because then you can you can also nicely distribute the votes on amongst the projects that are still open for voting. And you search for the unique ID because that's exactly the one that should be, should be in the URL uh, next to the project ID. So that's it, right? And this will already work now. So if we go to the start page here and reload it, then we expect clicking on this button to take us to the vote page with a project that we are allowed to vote for. And that's absolutely correct, right? Amazon Killer Business is one of the ones we did expect because we didn't yet vote for it. What happens now if I pretend I voted for it? So I just put my user here. So I voted now for this and this. Now the only option it has is this one. So let's try it out. Stop voting. Awesome. Now let's pretend I also voted for that one. So what will happen now? What do you think? Because there is no project to choose from so what will Bubble do when I click this button? Let's do it. Hit the like button, guys. I hit the voting button. Okay, so check this out. We run into something called an edge case. An edge case where Bubble cannot find the next project, so it just gives us an empty ID, but then the page doesn't look good and doesn't make any sense. So in this case, we would want to show the user a page that says, thank you for voting, obviously, there is nothing else you can vote for, so you know, thanks for your contribution, and you know, a link to some funny Giphy page like you saw in the beginning, or maybe not. But in any case, we need to handle that state. So how would we do that? 
Going back to our shared actions, reusable component, by the way, this is to be found here, to the workflows and to this logic that sends us to that, to that project page, the vote page, sorry. We have to say, listen, if there is no project that you can find, then redirect to a different page, right? So how would we do that? Well, we can use this logic, only when. So this whole thing should happen only when there is a project to vote for. So let's say we copy this expression, it's a right click, and we paste this expression here, and we say, is not empty. What does it mean? Well, it means that if the user is here on the start page, Bubble will not do anything, right? Because we said, if it's empty, then don't redirect. Okay, but we need to do something, no? So what we will do is we will basically copy and paste this logic. So we have it twice, okay? But we will say, if this is empty, right? If this is empty, so it's the opposite, then redirect, but to a different page. So we create a new page and we say thank you to the user and we clone, let's say, the index page. Okay. Before we try it out, let's make the thank you page look a bit nicer. You can see also on the thank you page we have some logic that we don't really need. And in the design tab, we just want to say something like, thanks for voting, something like that. Nothing major. And yeah, I mean, I will delete this and that. And shared actions is here, but why not? Yeah, it's okay. So let's try it. Reload, clicking on the button takes me to the thank you page, yay, cool. And I mean, you can go nuts here, right, on your creativity, but you see that we handle that case, so it cannot happen anymore that we get redirected to a project that is not really existing, to an empty one. Let's say I remove my vote from here manually, we'll just remove that, save it, so the user is gone now. So this project is open again for voting, so you can click the button, Bubble finds the project and I'm able to vote for it. So the whole logic makes a lot of sense and seems to work. Uh, happiness, happiness. Nice. Speaking of brain implant, who of you here has heard of Neuralink and would actually want to put it in their head? Comment down below. Okay, one more thing that I just noticed is let's say you're actually logged out and you are right now logged out and why do you still have access to the vote page because it doesn't make any sense right because even if you, you click the button here you, you don't have a user to store to the database so we just create a pretty inconsistent data store so what we want to do is we want to go through all the pages that we have and make sure that we redirect the user to the start page whenever there is no user that is logged in so what we do for that, we go to all the pages that need that logic. So definitely the vote page. So we say the following in the workflow. We say, if the user is logged out, Bubble has everything, right? Then we navigate, please, to the index page. Okay? And to be honest, we copy this one. Actually, let's make it red. I used to make it red because it really pops in that this is a security measure. And the same is for the thank you page. I mean, there is no good reason to have a thank you page for somebody that is not logged in. So we paste this in, we have the same logic, great. So now when we reload this page, we expect to get redirected back to the first page, the index page. Perfect. Another edge case solved. By the way, normal developers are total edge case managers and by doing no code here, we actually become the same, right? We need to make sure we cover all the edge cases, having no values, having too many values, being logged in, not being logged in. So all of these cases we need to think about. But don't worry, this is easy stuff. Just don't forget to handle them. Okay, now we're gonna do the most important workflow in this whole tutorial, which is the one that stores the votes into the database. 
For that, we log in again here. We start voting. Yes, there is a project we can vote for, but then when we click this button, nothing happens. That's what I'm talking about. So what should happen? We do expect to add the user here in this column for the project the user voted for. But we also expect to put the vote, which is the sliders, and the project that has been voted on plus the user that did that into this table. And the reason for that is that you want to export this later on as a CSV or an Excel and then evaluate it, right? You can do weighted average or whatever you want to use to evaluate who has won and then use the data later on for any other reporting purpose. So for that, we go to the vote page because that's the one we want to change. And we click on this button that we want to add logic for. And we start the workflow with this button. So what should happen? Well, we want to change data, right? So we go here, data, and Bubble calls this things. We want to make a change to a thing, which is to add the user here into this column. So this thing already exists and we want to make a change to it and to add something. So let's do that. That's fairly easy. Make change to thing. And now Bubble actually knows which project we're talking about because it already says parents groups project. And what parent of what? Well, parent of that button. And that button is part of this, this bigger group here that that we gave the project to, so it knows exactly which project we're talking about. And make change to thing. And now what we need to do is we say, users that voted, add something to that. Well, we add the current user. Okay, that's pretty cool. Let's test it. First reload the page because the business logic changed. Okay, so let's say we, we vote here, Five, six, seven, okay? Save vote. Maybe something happened, maybe not. But I tell you something happened, just that we didn't tell Bubble what to do afterwards. So let's check the database. Here is nothing, but let's refresh the data. And there is something. Okay, perfect. So of course, after the user clicked on the button, we need to redirect to the next project, which is the logic we put into the shared actions. Okay, but it's not all we need to do, right? We need to also, create a new thing, which is a vote to store all of these numeric values, right? So now it gets funky, but easy. So we need to say, okay, for the business model, the user has chosen the value of the slider, right? Of the slider that is really um, this one, right? Pretty cool. And Bob is so nice, it actually shows you exactly the component well, Okay, you don't know which slider it is if you don't give it a good name. That's why it's so important. Team, team slider, value, perfect. Uniqueness, uniqueness slider, value. But that's not all, right? We still have more fields. Which user voted? That guy, the current logged in user. For which project? Well, for the parents project. Damn, we're done. Okay, now we have put the user here and we will put the line here with the exact values the user has chosen for the project. Should we test it out? 100%. But first we need to remove ourselves from here, otherwise there is no project to vote for. But to be honest, let's make it even more interesting by saying that when we click save my vote, we not only store these things, we also just go to the next project, right? So we navigate, no, we <laughs> trigger this custom event from the shared components, which I didn't put on the page yet, damn. Shared actions. Okay. Anyway, it's invisible, it doesn't matter where it is, but now it's here, right? And we just go to the next project, it's so easy, yes? Now let's test it.
Okay, so choosing 9, 10, 8, saving my vote. I get redirected to the next project. I have the user been added to the project and I have been added here with exactly the vote that I took. Guys, time for the second part of the fortune cookie. Okay? No code magic. This is really good. So let's finish all of those projects. Rock and roll. Okay, works out. Data is legit. You see? Very nice. And there's no other project to vote for, so I'm done. I'm like, thank you, judge. You can go have fun. Okay. There is still an edge case, by the way. Actually, let me delete all of these entries because it's just for fun here. What I mean is exactly this problem here, that user gets here, zero, zero, and just clicks the button, and it's considered a vote, goes to the next project, right? And voted for basically zero, and that's not, it's not good, okay? We don't want this. So we have to now make sure that we handle this edge case. First, I'm cleaning up the database a little bit again so I can still vote, right? Okay, where's the logic for storing the vote? Well, it's in the vote page when I click on this button. So we just need to make sure we don't allow the user to click on this button, or I mean, the user can click on the button, but we shouldn't do an action when the user didn't choose at least one or 10, right? Zero is not an allowed value. So the easiest way to do this without a lot of magic and making this tutorial even longer is saying, you know what, we check all of these sliders and if their value is bigger than zero, then we just allow this action, right? So we go through all of those sliders and we make this change. So it's pretty simple, it's just repetitive. So business model value bigger than zero, team slider value bigger than zero, uniqueness bigger than zero, cool. So this action will just only happen when that's true and all these other things will only happen when that's true. So let's try it out. Okay, so just clicking the button, nothing happens. And that's okay for now. Of course, if you wanna make it super fancy, you would create a pop-up saying, what's going on, telling the user the problem, and then uh, the user can understand and just fix it. Okay, but as soon as the user chose at least one as a value, then the vote is saved and the redirect happens. So our business logic is still cool. Nice. What's left to be done is to make sure that the email address of the user is confirmed, which means that the user gets an email, has to click a link, basically to make sure that the user really has access to that email. And that link that they click will get them back to the app and the email will be confirmed. Only then they are allowed to vote. That logic is not there yet, but we will build it in the next section. Don't forget to smash the like button for this awesome tutorial with kilograms of coffee and passion for software. Okay. So in this section, we're gonna look at the email confirmation. And why is that important again? Well, because otherwise people could put any email address, create an account, then go vote, but that email doesn't really exist, so they could cheat. In order to avoid that, what we will be doing now is we'll create a page where the user gets redirected right after clicking start voting. And it says, please check your emails and confirm that you have access to that email. Once they get this email, they click on a link and they get redirected back to the app where it says, thanks for confirming your email and then you can go on and start voting. So first of all, we want to build the pages, the please confirm your email and the thank you for confirming, which will then lead to the vote. So we go ahead and we create two new pages and I will just clone the thank you page to make it a bit easier. So. Confirm email first. Cloning from here. Okay. 
and let's see which elements we have there is something hidden as well that's fine this one is also fine okay so this one here it will just say it will say confirm your email first and then it will say let's say another text here it will say something like please check your email and click on the confirmation link before you can start voting okay let's align these things here properly horizontally center and also let's make sure that this text is centered himself okay great let's quickly check who is allowed to see this page so of course you should only see this if you are logged in and this is perfectly fine because this rule here will make sure to redirect me back to the index page if I'm not logged in so that's perfectly fine I'm gonna go ahead and create the second page the thanks for confirming your email and then we're gonna build the workflow the logic I'm gonna clone from the previous one and just change some text let's say thanks for confirming or not your email is now confirmed let's make this a bit longer by the way I'm holding control to drag it on to the same size the same amount so yeah it's just a small trick now on this page we want the user to have a button to start voting again it's the same logic as on the other buttons which is really great because we have our shared actions here from which we can draw the logic to choose which project to vote for next so let's say you can start you can start voting now and just below that we're gonna put a button and you know what I will copy that button from a different page so I don't have to do this all over again okay mm, start voting just copy actually the whole group here and I will put it here and arrange arrange horizontally and you know what let's make those fields by holding control the same the same width here okay great and start voting has a workflow and let's check this out is it correct um, it doesn't have any so we want here to just make use of this um, custom event that is from a reusable component which we already have used and we're basically going to say go to next project that's all we have to do on this one we will see it in action soon okay but now let's focus on the email confirmation because we're not done yet so we created those two pages right we created confirm your email first and then also email confirmation where the user will arrive when clicking on the link from the email let's go back to the confirm email first because now here is actually the magic and okay let's make them same size as well okay so what happens here is that we need to go to the workflow of of that page and we need to say when the page is loaded then send a confirmation email at all to the user so that gets into the inbox so that the user can click on it so let's see how that would work out so every time you arrive here as a user it means you still need to confirm your email so it makes sense to send that email in that moment so what we do here we go to account and we say send confirmation email that email is preset by bubble there is a text that you can change in the settings but we will leave it the default for now so bubble now asks us okay but which page should I link to well link to email confirmation this is the page where it says thank you for confirming and that's it pretty easy stuff and you don't have to do anything for the confirmation to actually be stored in the database that's something that bubble will do in the background it's pretty transparent um, it's a bit hidden but it is there so the user will arrive here there will be a parameter in the URL given by Bubble himself and the, and the logic will work. Okay, let's test it. First, I go to the confirm email first page and I click on preview. The reason I'm doing this is because we didn't tell Bubble yet that the user must confirm the email before voting. We just created the pages, 
but we didn't yet tell him. So we want to just test it first and then we're gonna build the rest of the logic. Okay, so we arrived on this page and we expect that, let's see it, let's see it again, that we do send a confirmation email to that user. What is a bit strange is that we don't say which email we used for sending that email, so let's fix it. We want to put the email of the user that is logged in in that moment. So let's say, um, it says here, please check your email and let's put it in parentheses here and let's say insert dynamic data current users emails email address okay so that is a bit more clear where we sent it okay so it says please check your email which is this one and click on the confirmation link before you can start voting cool now, because I use the Mailinator inbox, I will just go here and yeah, actually there is this email already. So I can click on it and this is the link I have to click on. So let's do that. Bubble links to email confirmation, which we told him to. And it says, your email is now confirmed. You can start voting now. And then when I click on this button, I arrive on the project to vote for. Click the like button if you like what's happening right now. Okay, so that's nice, but let me show you what happens if a new user creates an account for voting. We sign up, and this user is user2. Okay, thank you. So now when the user clicks on start voting, the user will be sent to the project to vote for, but that's not what we want. We want the user to first confirm the email. So what we have to do is, of course, let's go one back, we want to change the logic here on this button and make sure that it first checks if the user has a confirmed email, in that case, uh, send the user to voting. But if the user does not have a confirmed email, send the user to that confirmed email page. Now, we did a good job by putting this logic for that button into the shared actions component, right? So that's really great because the only thing we have to do is we have to change this logic of go to next project and that's it it will work in the whole application so that's the power of putting the logic in one place and then reusing it huge recommendation for that approach by the way so what we have to do here is we have to say before we do these actions here we have to check something first we have to check if the mail is confirmed so we want to navigate to a page, but not here actually, before I do any logic. I want to drag this and put it here in front of the, of the existing logic. So the first thing I wanna check is if the user has a confirmed mail, and if not, then send him to that page. So confirm mail first, and only when current user email confirmed is no. Okay, what did we do right now? We told Bubble to go to a page, confirm email first, only when the user's email is not confirmed. Pretty cool. So that would already work. Just the problem is that Bubble would just continue with the workflow and it will also go to the vote page and stuff. So we don't want that. We want to terminate the workflow in that case. So we create another action and we say terminate this workflow. But first, we move it to the right place. So we drag and drop it here. And we say that we want to terminate this workflow only when the same logic, email, uh, user's email confirm is no. Okay, so we could also have copied this here, by the way, copy and paste the expression. So that would be easier. Um, unfortunately, there is no easier way to do this. So you really have to copy that logic once here and once there. So. First, we're gonna redirect, then we terminate the workflow. But if, if both of them not gonna happen, then of course, Bubble will do the logic that we were used to before. So now we can go to this page, to the start page, and remember, the user that is logged in is user two right now. Start voting. And you see, user two does not have a confirmed email, so I get redirected here. Let's check the inbox of that user. Let's quickly, oops. Okay, so that user got a confirmation email. I click on it as a user. I, yeah, nice. My email is confirmed, start voting. And now 
rock and roll, okay? So it works out. Let's vote now and pretend we are a real user here. Right, nice. Let's see the database, what happened there. We have, of course, a second user in the database in the users table. In the projects, we have two users voting for this one, right? And in the votes, we have another entry from user two voting these values here for this project. So we are perfectly done right now. So the app works exactly like expected. If you can create an account, you have to confirm your email and you can vote and the voting rules are respected. You can only vote once for every project after which you will be redirected to a thank you page. That's it everybody. Thank you for watching this long tutorial. I hope you learn a lot of stuff about how to create such an app in Bubble. I did show some tips and tricks along the way, so make sure to check it out. On YouTube, I will create sections in the video where you can jump um, directly into to check them out. And leave a thumbs up, subscribe if you want more of this great content. And it will help me a lot if you do so because it takes a lot of time to create these videos. I do enjoy it. And if you like it and you wanna support me, then destroy the like button and see you in the next one.